Good morning, and welcome to the First United Methodist Church of Portland. We are a reconciling congregation, a peace church, and a creation care congregation. All are welcome and accepted here. I'm Paul Cosgrove, one of the lay leaders. If you're joining us online, there's a link to today's order of worship in the description of the live stream. If you're here in person and didn't get a bulletin or a palm frond, as you entered, there are ushers in the back of the sanctuary who can help you. Please join me in the call to worship. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing of the one who rides on the back of a colt into the city. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing of the one who calls us by name and says, Come, follow me. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing of the one who shows us how to be holy, to grow in love for God, for ourselves, and for our neighbors.
Good morning and happy Palm Sunday. Most of us are up here already. I know that we've got lots of friends at home, but if you're in the congregation and want to come and join us up here, we would love to have you up here as well. I'm going to pass it off to one of our lovely choir friends, Eric. Hello, I'm Eric. I sing in the choir. So I noticed we have some special props today. Can anyone tell me why? Why? It's Palm Sunday. Now, um, the story of Palm Sunday is what we're telling today, and that's why we're waving these palms and we're welcoming Jesus. Now, what are some other stories that might be your favorites? Do you have, like, bedtime stories or books or movies that you like? Anyone? Yeah? Well, we all have our stories that are our favorite, but we're all part of our own stories, and everyone has their own story to tell. Um, like, like Jesus, we have an opportunity every day to be a part of someone else's story and to make positive differences in each person, to do something nice that can uplift someone who might need it or just bring a smile to a face. Um, can you guys think of some times that someone did something nice for you that really made your day? What? Tell me. When your mom comes back with a cookie. Yeah, when someone gives you a treat. You know, when someone gives you something special and you're not expecting it. It's very sweet. What about you? Oh, when you and your mom and your sister went to the mall, very special trip. Anyone else? Okay, one more. Um, my mom paid all this money for me to come down to New York. You, your mom paid all this money so you can go to New York. A, a, another special trip. Yeah, these, these small things that can be, some can be big, some can be small, but it's about an unexpected joy in your life, right? Now, you can do this to others, whether it's your friends, maybe doing something nice for a friend that they weren't expecting, doing something nice for your parents or your siblings if they're not expecting it, or a stranger if there's someone that you meet on the street and they're in a part of their story that you don't really know where they're at. They could always use something nice to make their story a little bit better, right? Now, I want you today to go to your friends and your parents and your family and ask them about their stories, how they got to where they are, and maybe some of the, the kind things that changed their, their stories and their lives. Now, can you guys repeat after me? Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for stories. Thank you for small kindnesses. And thank you for letting us do kindness to others. And all God's children said, Amen. This morning's congregational joys and concerns. O God, to whom we shout Hosanna, save us. We pray for a true, just peace over all your creation, especially in Gaza and Ukraine. We pray that you would move our hearts when we hear of violence against anyone, even those who themselves are violent. We pray for all those experiencing illness and difficulty in this season, and we pray for all others who we hold in our hearts and give over to God's care.
All glory, laud, and honor to you, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring. Oh God, we don't know if the children were actually the ones singing that day, but we know that somehow you found yourself on the back of a colt. Palm branches were laid down, coats were spread out, and you entered into the city of Jerusalem. There was confusion, there were questions, but there was unanimity in this. Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, was said over and over again. And like on that Palm Sunday long ago, we find ourselves shouting once again, Hosanna, Hosanna indeed. It's not words of joy or excitement. It's a word that simply means save us. Hosanna, oh God. Hosanna, save us from war and violence. Hosanna, save us from the changes in temperature and destruction to our climate. Hosanna, save us from our Adama animosity towards one another. Help us to see each other as human beings so that we might work for peace. Hosanna, save our houseless neighbors. Hosanna, save our hungry neighbors. Hosanna, save us. Help us to be and become the people whom you have dreamed and created us to be. Hosanna. Help us to see, O oh God, that it might be, in fact, we who come in your name. As ones who have been called by you, as ones who have said yes when you turned to us and said, come and follow me. Help us to put our palm branches down and instead, with our hands and our feet, be the ones, be the ones who hear the cries of the needy, to be the ones not riding on donkeys, but who simply walk into our neighborhoods as ambassadors of love and justice. And so, oh God, as we get to the work of salvation, let us do so first and foremost through prayer praying the words that your son Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, the peace of Christ be with you. Let us now stand and offer signs of peace and reconciliation to one another.
welcome back, Allison. Thank you, Jonas. And welcome all to Holy Week. We have made it. Pastor Ethan and I were commenting that it didn't, didn't quite feel like Holy Week yet while we were doing our pre-worship things this morning, but I think now, now we're here. This Palm Sunday, we will experience the narrative in full as we have already begun to do so. But this really is just the first part of the service, the first part of the story, which will continue when we come back here Thursday and then celebrate this next Sunday. So as you listen for how the Spirit is moving through these words today, remember that there's, there's a cliffhanger there. So let's listen. verses 1 through 11. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage at Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, Go into the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says, says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, Its master needs it and he will send it back right away. They went and found a colt tied to a gate outside on the street, and they untied it. Some people standing around said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told him that just what Jesus said, and they left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their clothes out on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. After he looked around at everything, because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. The word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me? O Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. What even was that, they might have said? Is he just playing with us? They may have asked. Does he think this is funny? Now, the reenactment of the lively, palm-laden entry, it brings joy to our time of worship, but it doesn't give us an accurate sense of the event. Whether it's daily or annual, our rereading of scripture, it can anesthetize its impact on us. The words of the text, they can become static in our minds. And so given that, that we modern readers or hearers are not only unfamiliar with the geography of the journey, but also largely disconnected from its emotional threads, we can dial into this part of the narrative by imagining a, a fictional lower stakes comparison. Because it turns out that if, if you look up a walk that would be similar to the one that we read of today, this Palm Sunday journey up and down the Mount of Olives and to the temple is a similar distance and elevation that's heading from right here up to the Japanese garden, and over to the Oregon Zoo. So, stay with me. We are going to take a deep dive into this comparison, and then we're going to re-experience the text from a similar vantage point. So imagine for me, or imagine with me, what it would be like for our Palm Sunday Jesus to take a group of our kids to the Oregon Zoo. From their perspective, Jesus has given every indication that he intends to see animals at the zoo. He has zoo pamphlets. He's been talking about elephants and tigers and bears. He's even mapped out the directions for how to get there. The group of kids are so, so thrilled. He's really going to take them to the zoo. They're going to get to experience it for themselves because up until this point, they had only ever heard they had only ever heard of the elephants and the tigers and the bears from their parents and their grandparents and the generations that came before them. They hadn't experienced it for themselves. And so they start walking right from here, right from those front doors, up and up and up the steep incline all the way up to the Japanese garden. 
They meander through the Japanese garden. They see the breathtaking view of the city. And then they walk over to the Oregon Zoo. And as evidence of their excitement, the group, this group of kids, they provide their own juice boxes and Lunchables to Jesus along the walk. These things are important to them. And the zoo and this journey is even more important still. An hour of climbing and tumbling and electric anticipation, just like the walk from Bethphage up the steep, steep incline to the Mount of Olives with its breathtaking view of the city and finally walking through the valley and over to the temple in Jerusalem. So finally, Jesus and the kids, they make it to the zoo. Jesus marches in through those entry stalls right under that big sign that says Oregon Zoo and stands at the zoo's entry plaza, just just taking it all in. And then, as if there weren't a very clear purpose to their journey there, he turns around and walks back out. No elephants, no tigers, no bears. The kids are shocked. Where was the misunderstanding here? Was he not talking about these animals because he wanted to see them at the zoo with them? Did he not have zoo pamphlets because he wanted to visit? Their apparent shock doesn't impact him, and he begins to walk back down out to somewhere in Northwest, somewhere in the Alphabet District, where he's staying the night. And the kids largely agree. Jesus is the world's worst zoo chaperone. They're picking someone different next time. (laughs) And with that, they disperse for the evening. This Jesus at the zoo parallel (laughs) captures not only the length of the journey to and fro, it's five miles and some decent hills. I've mapped both journeys and they match up. It also captures, though, the absurdity and the disappointment of the scene. The purpose of Jesus' grand entrance It seemed so clear. It checked so many boxes. But starting with that arrival in the temple where nothing happened, it starts to go differently than anyone expects. And eventually so different, so unexpected, that we find ourselves at the foot of the cross just days later. Some may call it triumphant. Some might call it street theater. We talked about that last week or last year. Others might call it a grand royal procession. Still others, a protest, a direct action. There might be some truth in each of these, but from the perspective of someone in the crowd, someone who had taken their own coat or rushed to cut new growth from the fields to tamp down the dusty ground that that colt rode upon, The word that reverberated in their mind was disappointment. Jesus of Nazareth was a remarkable disappointment. Things have been so hard in and around Jerusalem, and they seem even more difficult still around these holy days, more tense, more fraught. Everything just feels so complicated. It's hard to know who to trust, who to place your meager ounce of hope in. Who has the real answer for for my people and your people to live in peace together? And we're talking about the kind of peace where you can rest, exhale, feel joy, not just the kind of peace where violence is on vacation for a week or two. What even was that? There was so much anticipation. We're just so ready for a sense of relief, so ready for new energy to turn a new corner, for someone to fix all the problems all the mistakes that all the leaders that came before them have made. People wanted a leader, a real leader. So Jesus of Nazareth comes around, and there have been whispers. There have been whispers. He seems almost shy, like he doesn't want people to know that he can heal, doesn't want people to hear that he might be royalty. But there have been whispers. And those whispers have been followed by wondering. What if he's the one? Passover, it's both the exact time where you can have these these grand imaginations of liberation and the exact time that you are reminded this is not an easy path. 
It's the Passover festival that celebrates liberation from the enslaving Egyptians. Everyone wants to come to Jerusalem for Passover. The, the surge of pilgrims caused the unmistakable barbecue scent of the temple sacrifices that just blanket the city. And with each whiff comes the generational memory of what it was like to be free, what it was like for God to send someone to deliver them from their hardship. With countless people packed into the city and spirited celebrations of a past freedom no longer held, it brought an even stronger yearning for freedom today, this time from the Romans. But the Romans, it turns out that they are nearly mind readers. Because every Passover, there seemed to be more of them coming into Jerusalem from the west with all manner of pomp and circumstance. And it would be impressive if it weren't a signal to the Passover people not to try any funny business. The Roman governor himself would come inland from Caesarea, a guy named Pontius Pilate. There would be no revolutions under their watch. But in between the whispers and the wonderings, in between the temple sacrifices and the raw political and military power of the Roman Empire, that Jesus of Nazareth, he gathered folks up. The Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives. You can see why someone could have thought that he would be the one. Honestly, if he didn't want people to think he was going to be king, he shouldn't have started at the Mount of Olives. Even synagogue dropouts know the history from the prophet Zechariah. The prophet tells us that it's, it's God himself, the divine, who stands there at the Mount of Olives, surveying the landscape around them while the world splits in two. And what does it feel like right now except the world splitting itself in two? The prophet says that a king will come, victorious, triumphant, humble, riding on a donkey. Why else would Jesus bother having everyone schlep all the way up the hill when he could have just gathered everyone in the valley right next to the temple? I mean, the Mount of Olives. There were inklings. There were whispers. And to confirm all suspicions, Jesus asks for a young donkey, a colt, to ride into the city. The donkey, just like the prophet said, and as soon as people saw that, as soon as people saw the donkey, an intensity took over. People started grabbing what they could, their only cloak, new growth from the fields that had just finished growing, began to surround that small donkey, clamoring before and behind it. It was Passover, after all. The liturgy of the Hagim is fresh on people's lips, so it feels almost automatic, almost scripted. For everyone to shout the words of the psalmist, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And then, Hosanna, save us. Save now. At this point, the crowd is thinking, maybe he really is the one. Maybe he's here to pick up where the King David left off. And these people tumbling into the temple in Jerusalem... They're among the first to witness that new reign. Because the people, the people really are tired. They're tired of being ruled with an iron fist. They're tired of a system of exploitation that's been in place so long, they have no, imagina no imagination for any alternative. They're ready for a new life. They're ready to actually live. So they shout, Hosanna! Save now. And this crowd, they finally get to the temple, teeming with excitement and shouts of joy and desperation. You can't tell the difference between the two. And Jesus stops, taking it all in. And this is the part that really doesn't make any sense. He turns around. He goes home. There was no speech. There's no grand ritual or sacrifice. He led no charge attack, distributed no weapons, pulled down no statues, detained no powerful people. It was everything the prophet said, but nothing happened. He just went back. He said he's spending the night in Bethany. It's an hour walk back from where we just came from. As if we weren't all waiting. 
as if we weren't all holding our breath for what would happen next. What even was that? What, what kind of king is he? It's like he didn't even come to fight. It sounds like the whispers were wrong. This guy's not the revolution. Maybe the governor will give back Barabbas, though. He's a bandit revolutionary. He won't just play dress up. He'll really get down to business. Not this man, but maybe Barabbas. From the crowd's vantage point, Jesus of Nazareth is a remarkable disappointment. And from our vantage point, here today, you can't hardly blame them. For those wanting the war horse, the forceful revolution that finally brings relief, the reversal of power so that for once they can finally feel safe, the judgment and punishment of those who have wronged as a recognition of the pain they have caused, for those longing for these things, Jesus is a big disappointment. But for those who thirst for the water of life, for those who long for the unrelenting love of the divine that comes to us and through us, for those who yearn for the equalizing of all power so that for once all feel safe, for those who need the rehabilitation and the reconciliation of all wrongs as a recognition that we need to end the cycle of pain, for all these, Jesus of Nazareth is the one in whom hope lives. The catch, though, the catch is that for most of them in the crowd and for many of us here, there are parts of ourselves who want both of these things. There's a part of us who really wants that reckoning. Oh, it would be so satisfying. There's also a part of us who yearn for compassion. And perhaps all the crowd, all that we can do, is to repeat that litany, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save now. It's a, it's a simple and vague prayer, but some days it's the best that we can offer. One writer comments that the salvation for which God yearns is the integrating of the whole creation, reconciling humans not only with God, but also with one another and the earth itself. And Jesus doesn't do this with splendor or force or violence. He doesn't live up to the expectations of, of the king riding in on the war horse with expert military strategy and an ingenious way to liberate Jerusalem from the Romans. He comes instead with humility, vulnerability, like facing a SWAT team with flimsy poster board and flowers. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who confounds and disappoints. Blessed is the one who will lead us to true life beyond our own limited imaginations. Blessed is the one who makes the world whole. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Friends, we enter now into the time in our service in which we respond to the God whom we have met in worship this day. Through the giving of our gifts, tithes, and offerings, but also remind us of the ways in which we can respond uh, after worship and throughout the week as we find ourselves walking through these doors. I remember my first Palm Sunday here four years ago, we were handing out palm branches as you rolled down uh, the windows of your cars. Um, we're going to channel that same creativity uh, at the end of worship today. As it's, you can see, it's a little bit damp outside, and we're supposed to have uh, our annual Easter egg hunt. So the sanctuary is going to become the venue for the Easter egg hunt, and you all get to participate uh, in the hiding of eggs. Um, Pastor Karen will have more instructions about that uh, during the benediction. Uh, but remember that that's coming. Just brace yourselves. Uh, it will be okay. Um, <laughs> 
along with hunting eggs, uh, we'll also have uh, just all of the activities of our spring festival, all kinds of games. Uh, you can, uh, our global missions committee is selling uh, Palestinian olive oil and coffee hour there as well. And as we've been reminded uh, today, we embark on the journey of Holy Week. Um, on Wednesday, our Peace Project group is hosting a prayer labyrinth from 2 to 7 in Collins Hall. Uh, it doesn't take five hours uh, to walk through the prayer labyrinth. Uh, you, can, you can come and go at any time. It'll take about 25, 30 minutes, and it just is simply uh, a spiritual practice uh, to dig into the grace that we have been talking about throughout this season. And then on Thursday night, we'll gather right back here at 7 o'clock for Holy Communion and also a service of Tenebrae as we remember the upper room and also tell the story of the events of Jesus' final days uh, and his death on the cross. That service will be live streamed as well. Um, and then Sunday, uh, note just a little time change in our worship. We'll, ha- we'll still have two services that day, but they'll be both at, at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock right here in the sanctuary, uh, live streamed as well. It's the same service uh, at both times. Uh, Simply pick the one uh, that fits best for your Easter schedule. Um, And then in the days after Easter, uh, Sunday, April 7th, our land and housing group is hosting another of their forums. Uh, Our new member class uh, for this quarter starts on April 14th. So if you're interested uh, in making this place your home, uh, reach out to me for more information about that class. And also we're uh, beginning the season of nominations. So if you're uh, feeling called to a particular uh, area, uh, area of ministry, one of our administrative committees or programming committees, uh, reach out to Pastor Karen about that. That is more than enough announcements for one morning. So as the ushers come forward, uh, prepare your offering. There are offering envelopes uh, in the pew rack in front of you, uh, or along with those at home, feel free to pull out your phone or device uh, and visit our website, fumcpdx.org slash give. Or if that's on auto pay, simply just give thanks uh, that you've got that set uh, and are living out uh, your gift and tithe to our church. Uh, But friends, as we prepare to give, let us enter into prayer together. O Holy One, as we will remember in the days ahead, your Son, Jesus Christ, gives himself to us in bread and wine, and also through death on the cross. Help us, in turn, to also give of ourselves, our gifts, our time, our talents, our resources, so that others might experience the same grace that we will partake in and remember through Christ's life, death, and resurrection. In the name of the one whom we follow, we pray. Amen.
My friends, before we go forth from the benediction, I have some instructions for you. In a moment during the postlude, Jonas, I checked with Jonas, he will be playing the most epic egg-hiding music you have ever hidden eggs to. This is not a traditional postlude. And the youth will be coming down the center aisle with basket, or no baskets, bags of eggs for each row. And you can, you can either sit and enjoy the postlude and just sort of hide as you're sitting there, or uh, you can let it happen around you. But either way, the egg-hiding needs to happen like now because we have kids who are so excited to hunt for some eggs and the weather radar says that it's supposed to start raining again right when the egg hunt is supposed to begin. Uh, so after the eggs are successfully hidden, just, just right in your pew, uh, if you are unfortunately either in the choir loft or in the balcony, we're not hiding eggs up the stairs. So you can descend upon the general floor here and help others hide. After that, if you would just scurry as fast as you are able out to the narthex, out to the spring festival and coffee hour in Collins, that will avoid you um, getting trampled by... <laughs> by children and youth who, who want those eggs. So, so those are our instructions. And with that, my friends, it is Holy Week. We have celebrated Palm Sunday, and let us all now go forth in the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Egg hunt in peace. Amen.